This is where did the road go? Our aim is to explore the fringe, to be true skeptics and question openly, to investigate the paranormal, bring light to the dark corners of history, and give a voice to the shunned of science. We deal in mystery and the important questions that these subjects bring to light. What is reality? Who are we? And why are we here? Join us on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com for a full show archive, links to all our social media, upcoming schedule, and much, much more. Now, join your host Soraya on this week's edition of Where Did the Road Go? Yes, and I made a new intro. I hope, uh, I hope everyone likes it a touch longer, but I think it's more accurate than what I started with, which I made literally the first week of the show before I really knew where the show was going. So, uh, yeah, there you go. All right. So tonight on Where'd the Road Go, we have with us Melanie Zimmer. Hello, Melanie. Hi. How are you, Soraya? I am good. A little rushed, as were you. (laughs) As you see, the parking situation at the station here is not the greatest, Um, but it's, you know, a nice building. Well, if you hear me huffing and puffing, it's because I've been running down the street <laughs> from reparking my car, so I didn't get towed away. Uh, okay, so um, you've written you've written quite a few books. The latest, this is the latest, right? Right, Curiosities of the Finger Lakes, Hidden Ancient Ruins, Flying Machines, The Boy Who Caught a Trout with His Nose, and more. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is uh, on History Press. And this you've written primarily about upstate New York, right? Yes, upstate New York um, in one version or another. Actually, one of my books, the second book, um, encompassed the whole state except for New York City. Okay. And a lot of people out there, I mean, this show gets listened to worldwide. And a lot of people, when you say New York, they only think about New York City. That's true. <laughs> and, in fact... Um, When I was asked to do the first book by the History Press, one of the things that they demanded of me is I do a marketing plan, and I had to go to the bookstores and look and see what was out there. And Mm. it was very skewed toward New York City um, as as far as the material. The first book was Myth, Legend, and Lore, so that was the kind of material I was looking for, and it was remarkable how much was not out there. There were things on the Adirondacks, and there were things on Ghosts, but there was not a lot else and um the material is really very rich this area is very very rich in in um, folklore and history and all sorts of stories then um so i was uh, very pleased to be able to write some of those down and share them with people yeah okay and this one when did this one come out this new one curiosities of the finger lakes um this one came out well let's see i submitted it in march so it came out what was the date? <laughs> well, the, it came it, out in the summer. I think it came out in June. Okay. All right. So so it's this year, obviously. Yes, yes. It's new. And uh, how many do you have total? Uh, there are four. Okay. There are and, four. And you also do a, a puppet show? Right. I work as Dancing Bear Puppet Theater. I, I also work as a storyteller. Um, now most of my work is primarily um, puppet theater. So I do puppet shows uh, for, for children. I'm mm-hmm. itinerant. Oh, okay. So, in fact, that's one of the reasons um, I was asked to write the books is because I was a storyteller, and they thought a storyteller would know some of the stories that, from our area and also to be able to tell them well. Yeah, and this area is very rich in history, and I knew a lot of it, and there was a ton of stuff on here in this book that I had no idea about. Well, I think that's that's one of the exciting things. In fact, when I had to submit a proposal before I started the book, and... Uh, by the time I really got into researching it, I was discovering all sorts of things that I was not aware of, and I actually did end up changing the proposal and, and, and <laughs> begging the publisher to, to allow me to make changes because I I was ignorant. Also, um, one thing I found on doing the research on um, the different books is that oftentimes um, stories are known in a particular area, but when you walk outside of that area, no matter how small that you know distance may be, yeah. uh, sometimes those stories aren't known. So I think that's part of it. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about the myths of the Seneca Indians. And they, uh, you, you, this is how you start the book. Oh, uh, yeah. I like to start at the beginning. And I, they, <laughs> they tend to have a lot of uh, stories about creation and how things began. So that's what makes those stories interesting to me. Yeah, yeah. And uh, now, do they claim to be the first people here? Well, 
<laughs> yes and no. Um, um, there's a the marvelous story about the how the um, Seneca came into existence. Mm-hmm. So in, in that fashion, from a mythological point of view, I would say yes. But from a from an archaeological point of view or historical point of view, the answer would be no. So maybe I should start with the myth. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Um, so. This, this, the myth of the Seneca um, really evolves around a place called Bear Hill, uh, which is in the uh, Rushville area. And it is called Bear Hill because historically it was um, rather denuded on the top. It didn't have a lot of vegetation or, or trees okay. or whatnot. Bear, bear like B-A-R-E. Right, okay. right, okay. exactly. And um, the story is that the... Um, the Seneca emerged from Bear Hill, and um, the creator took them and, and all the people, and he took them down the Mohawk River and they down along next to the Hudson all the way to the sea. And then the people spread out into different groups, and he gathered them back up, and he headed them back up the Hudson and then back up the Mohawk, and he began to deposit people along the way in, in family groups. And the Mohawks were east, and then came the Oneidas uh, a little bit further west, and then we have the Cugas and the Senecas. And is he left each people there they had a slightly different language and um, so when when all um, the five were there they there was a group of, of people that continued on um, and they went to the Mississippi River and they began to cross um, using a vine and I don't know how they used the vine if they were walking across it or <laughs> swinging across right, well right. whatever the way there was a problem the vine broke and half the people were on one side of the Mississippi River half the people were on the other side of the Mississippi River and they realized that they weren't going to be together well the people that had crossed the Mississippi and were on the western side um, they degenerated and became what became known as stone giants. Um, mm. They began to lose their cultural identity and they began to live very primitively. And they had that strange habit of rolling in the, the sand and covering their entire body with this hard encrustation of sand. And this protected them from spear and arrow tips. And they became much feared and, and really a horrible creatures. And um, that, you know, this whole there's a whole series of... Um, of um, stories about stone giants and what they do. But I mean, the very existence of, or, you know, said existence of these stone giants uh, gave credence when they found the um, the Cardiff giant. People thought, ooh, those stories of those stone giants, they must be true, you know? So so anyway, but that's just an aside. So the people who didn't cross the Mississippi River, they, they headed down all the way down to North Carolina by the Neuse River, and they remained there. They became the Tuscarora people, and eventually they would come back and join the others, and they became the Sixth Nation. So so that is a little bit about, you know, the, the this myth of Bear Hill, but that's not all. I mean, Bear Hill's, <laughs> Bear Hill's really a rich place. And um, they actually, there was a historical uh, Seneca village on Bear Hill, and, and that's known. And I think they had their festival of light in the, in the autumn um, from that uh, village. And, um, and there's a story about... Um, that place that the the Seneca have. Um, One day there was a boy who was out canoeing and he saw in the water uh, a beautiful colorful snake and it was a small snake and he he just he captured it and brought it back to the village and he decided that he was going to raise it as a pet and he started feeding it and you know he'd feed it little mice or whatever and got bigger and bigger until until it finally grew to the point where you know the warriors were having to go out and and down deer and you know whatever a bear who knows what and bring it back and feed this thing it was becoming enormous and and the people became concerned and they um they uh, they began to talk among themselves and decided the safest course of action this, this thing was just too dangerous was to actually sneak out and build a fortified village somewhere else and just leave the snake there move on so um they did that and they um, 
unfortunately, were discovered by the snake. Somehow he got wind of this and he surrounded the village and just crushed them all and, mm. and killed everybody. You know, all of the Seneca, except for a young boy and a young girl that remain on Bear Hill. And of course, they were pretty wise now as to, you know, this is pretty dangerous. We've got to do something. They didn't really know what to do. But the boy had a prophetic dream. And in the dream, he learned that he could kill the snake by um, shooting an arrow in a certain space, uh, like a scale behind his eye. Mm. And so at the first opportunity, you know, <laughs> he shoots the arrow. And the snake the snake does die, but, but it, it doesn't die quickly, unfortunately. It begins to thrash around. And as it thrashes around, it decapitates all those all those Seneca that's already killed at that other site. <laughs> oh, so, beautiful. It, so all the heads go everywhere. And if you go to Bear Hill today and you see these large stones are called Indian heads by the people around the area because they're said to be the heads of these people mm. who uh, were killed by this horrible snake. And um, furthermore, as it began to thrash, it, it denuded Bear Hill. It, it, it took out all the vegetation in the bushes and whatnot. Oh, okay. and, and so we have the, the historic, you know, Bear Hill. It's not bare, it's not bare today. Uh, it is a conservation area, so you can actually go there and hike. Mm. Um, but at there's more. <laughs> as okay. I say, as right. I say, this area is very, very rich. Yeah. Um, at one point, well, at one point, at many points, there was, there was, for an extremely long period of time until I think in the twenties, um, ruins, on stone ruins on top of Bear Hill. Right. And they, it was called the site was called Old Fort. And, and the Seneca actually did occupy it for a period of time. They, you know, they lived there and occupied it, but people asked them, did, did you build this? And they denied it. They said, no, it was there. Right. And, and it was this stone structure. So, you know, they, they didn't build with stone anyway. So, you know, it was unlikely they did actually build it. But um, they, um, you know, people, people wondered where these were from. And, and it was actually referenced um, by a few writers over the years, but nobody really drew it or, you know, made a study of it or any right. such thing. And then for whatever reason, the uh, Middlesex Highway Department decided they were going to take it and use it for um, road fill. <laughs> Beautiful. So, yeah, they sent a crew up in a steam shovel and they, you know, collected it all and they brought it down the hill and they put it on a, uh, a, a stone boat, they call it, and they took it up and they uh, used it on North um, Vine Valley Road, I think. It's, it's you, you, see, you see that uh, happening now, too, down in, in South America and Central America, where they're literally destroying these some of these ancient pyramids and using them as fill for roads and things like it that. It has been happening for, for a long time, but, so, but you know, nobody knew who those people were who built this stone structure. And, and, the, and um, there's a suggestion. I don't mean to interrupt. No, that's okay. Suggestion. Um, at the base of Bear Hill, <laughs> there was a gravel pit and several um, Indian remains were found there. But one day, this was some time ago, um, uh, w w someone was digging in the gravel pit and they actually found an Indian sitting up smoking a pipe. <laughs> hmm. And, of course, they called the Rochester Museum, Arthur Parker, who was a Seneca himself and later went on to um, be work at um, head the New York State Museum, mm -hmm. um, came and collected it. And from the skeleton, from the skull, really, they could tell that it was an Adena person. And then Adena people were mound builders. I think they lived... Um, so from back, the Ohio Valley, that area? Uh, yeah, and in other places as well. They they lived up to like a thousand BC. So, you know, okay, it's quite right. quite some time ago until uh, you know some. Uh, well, that was actually going to be my question. If you thought there was a connection between that and the mound bu building culture of uh, the mid you know, the Midwest. Um, uh, the, the Dinas certainly did live, um, you know, in, in the Ohio area and other areas, but they were able to identify the. the person as being an Adena because of the deformation of the skull. Mm. Um, the Adena had um, a beautification habit where they would tie a, um, essentially a board right. to the forehead yeah. yep. 
um, of young people, and as they grew, then their skull would become flattened. Mm-hmm. And so, as they saw this this uh, skeleton, they they noted that you know it had the flattened forehead, and so they were able to identify it as a Dina. Whether or not that the structure at the top of the hill is a Dina, we don't really know. Right, right. But you know it. It's definitely a possibility. But he was buried be- smoking Sitting a pipe. up smoking a pipe, yes. <laughs> it, it was very um, um, distressful for the person who found him, actually. <laughs> <laughs> now, are you familiar? I, you, I think you said you're not that familiar with the, the finds of giants in western New York? Oh. Giant skeletons? Oh, no, I'm not familiar with giant okay. skeletons. Okay. Because um, there have been a lot of giant skeletons found in western New York, not so much into central and as well as Ohio and around the mound building cultures. And a lot of the Indians in that area have said that they were the ones who built the mounds, were these giants. Oh, not them. Uh, oh, oh, that's fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> but you do have stories of little people, don't you? I do. I do. Um, there are, um, let's see, there are a couple. Well, there's a tradition among the the Indians of little people, and by that, actually, there are across the continent. It's not yeah, just yeah. it's not just the Haudenosaunee. It's um, many peoples, and they are small magical people who have. Um, um, well, they're very easily irritated, mm. so you don't want to get on their bad side, right, and, right. and they can bring you they can bring you bad luck. They don't always bring you bad luck, but you know they can affect your crops and you know, other things. They can do things to you. So, so um, there was a uh, you know quite a tradition of little people. Um, people often didn't like to speak about them because they were considered um, to be ill luck sometimes. And um, I, I've actually met someone who has um, a Native American who has um, seen one and. You know, they would be dressed as as though you would imagine a, a Native American would dress. Them. Mm. I also. Um, You're away from the mic a little. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> no, I, I also um, came across a person who had uh, an experience of little people, and he wasn't a Native American, so that was you know quite mm. a different experience, and, right. and the people were the little people were dressed differently and, and so on and so forth. So I just really like to read this little tiny passage. Yeah, this, was a, this was a person I had met years ago and just kind of in passing. And then one day he showed up at, um, I was talking at a historical society and he showed up and I didn't even recognize him and he bought my book and then emailed me from, um, I think North Carolina, wherever hmm. he was living. And he, he, he said, he told me about this experience that he had as a boy in the area. And, and I asked, I said, well, you know, can I, can I use that and publish it? And he said, yeah, I think the kids would like to read about that in a book. <laughs> so, so I did. Um, and his name was Aaron S. Popple. And he lived in a small place called Whitelaw. And Whitelaw is in Madison County. And I live on the border of, you know, I live in Oneida County, but I live near Madison County and I never heard of the place. Mm-hmm. And that's because it's so very small. <laughs> <laughs> I he was like, well, well, where is this place? And I, and it has there's a church, and there's a couple farms, and that's kind of it. It's 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 near the Swamp Conservancy. Uh, let's see. Um, so I'm going to read you his experience. Okay. I was about five or so. We moved in with my stepdad to his country farm. White Law, New York was and still is sparsely populated. It was December, just before Christmas of 1978. There was snow on the ground. The moon was almost full. And if, and if any of you have ever lived in the snow belt, you know the type of night this was. Crisp air, clear skies, a full moon, and snow on the ground. It was very bright outside that night. I was sitting looking out the west window toward the road. There were no cars out in those days. I was looking for shooting stars, and it was too cold to be outside, so I looked out my windows. Then three little people came out of nowhere. They were running down the road when they noticed me in the window. One pointed, they waved, and they did acrobatics in the road. I could see their silhouettes, pointy gesture hats and shoes with toes curled up. They were all doing somersaults, and one was juggling. They waved goodbye and took off down the road on their way. I immediately woke up my mom to tell her that Santa's elves had just been there (laughs) to check up on me. Of course, this was met with the usual parental response. It took me a while not to believe in Santa. 
I saw his freaking elves. <laughs> Over the years, I've written this off as unexplained, or maybe I dozed off in a dream. After all, it was rather late at night. But just tonight, I was visiting with my tenant who grew up who grew up in the area, and he claims that he was riding with his boss, a local farmer up the road. Then, out of the blue, two little people ran out in front of them as they drove by our farmhouse. The elves were dressed in wool coats and pointy shoes. The guy was four years older than me, and he was 16 at the time. Then he told me of another farmer who always said, the little people are here in White Law. We have allegedly seen little folks skating on White Law too, or people have allegedly seen little folks skating on the pond in White Law. Ten years ago, a neighbor girl told me she used to camp out in her treehouse. She claims to have heard little scampering noises, giggling, and weird music playing from the forest floor below. So that was an experience that he had and shared with yeah. me. Now you get them all around the world as well, but yeah, it's exactly. interesting that there's so many in that one little area. It is. It is, and they, they rather match the description of each other. Yeah. Which yeah. which doesn't sound like a Native American little person. It is more, you know, almost, uh, you know, like a elf or fairy from yes, yeah. from Ireland, perhaps, yep. some sort of things. Maybe they came over on the boat. <laughs> <laughs> I Actually, years ago, I, I actually was giving a talk on, um, on leprechauns. It was, you know, mm -hmm. around St. Patrick's Day, and... After people actually did come up to me and say, I've seen them. Yeah. yeah. So apparently, you know, apparently people do see them around here. Well, uh, Jacques Vallée, a uh, UFO researcher, had speculated back in, in 69 that the stories of little people and the stories of UFO encounters were very, very similar in their archetype. And they may be being caused by the same phenomena. So that people might actually have seen little people at one point. Now they're seeing spaceships, but it's the same thing. Hmm. <laughs> because both of them abduct people. In both cases, you have missing time situations. The fairies would take someone, they'd feel they were gone 10 minutes, they'd be gone six years. You know, it, there's a lot of similarities in there. So they could be sitting in an altered state of consciousness, and maybe that area is more prone to putting people in that state. I don't know. I really wanted to see what I didn't. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I, I it was like, I felt really obvious sitting there on a street corner in the middle of nowhere, you know, <laughs> apart. And I looked around. It's like, I don't see one. I'd really like to see one, but it didn't happen. How, <laughs> how, how big is the town? Is it a real small, like, blink and you'll miss it type of place? Oh, yeah. It's, I mean, there's not even a store. It's just, <laughs> I mean, it, it's a couple, literally, it's a couple farms and at a church. It's like a crossroads. And little it's, people, apparently. Yeah, very. <laughs> Apparently, I mean, maybe they're half the population. I don't know. Wow. Um, there was another set of ruins uh, up in Bluff Point, I think it was. Bluff Point. That That is the thing that probably blew me away the most when I was researching the book because I didn't know about that before I, I started researching the book. And it wasn't in my original proposal. But I, I had read a, a brief... Um, uh, just like somebody mentioned that Bluff Point ruins in, in a sentence somewhere. And I mm -hmm. thought... What is that? And I started looking into it, and um, I became fascinated by it. Um, there were a set of ruins, approximately 14 acres of stonework ruins on Bluff Point. And these were well documented, unlike Old Fort, which we know existed because, you know, we do have references to it. But, you know, this was actually surveyed mm. by two men. And uh, there was a father-son team, and in the 1880s, I think around 1880, um, it was Samuel Hartwright and his son Berlin Wright, and um, two interesting men in, the, in their own right. Um, the son left a little biography of them, so we know a bit about them. Um, Samuel Hartwright was a doctor, but he had been raised um, on a farm, and, and one night he became very interested in science um, when one night two workmen who had been working, I think, putting fence posts in or some such thing, pulled out these um, maps of the sky and they began, you know, identifying stars and he wanted to get into astronomy. So he got into astronomy and and, and they got into uh, looking at fossils and conchology and all sorts of different things. And uh, they were very interested in, in all aspects of science. And, and they did what was uh, the first survey for New York State of Yates County. And um, in that survey was the survey of Bluff Point. So I, I wish I could 
just show you right through this microphone this beautiful survey map <laughs> that, that, that is preserved even today. But um, it, it's very fascinating because it, it's you know quite geometrical in form. And there are these structures that they call graded ways. And of course, I didn't know what a graded way was. And fortunately, they drew one at the bottom of the survey map. So I'll try to describe it in words. It's, they're raised areas. They look like they could be walkways. We don't think they are, but, they, but basically um, diagonal sides um, in stone with a stone cap across the top. Mm. And they could run 500 feet long. They or you know an, or another length you know varied in length um they could be three feet wide they could be eight feet wide um at the time of the survey they estimated two feet above the ground hmm. and um there so there's this big intricate pattern of all these quote graded ways and nobody really knew what the site was and it was made of stone and um the surveyors were very thorough. They they not only mapped the whole thing. There were um, standing monoliths and some fallen. Yeah. There they found maze that. Um, thank goodness they were interested in biology because they I actually identified the maze or yeah. believe they did. This ancient maze appeared to be the same kind of kernel that they found uh, down at the um, from Florida. Oh, around okay. the time the king conquistadors were coming through right. and and um, they collected some of that maze but it, it later crumbled i believe and um there was evidence uh, occasionally of holes that looked like they could have held posts so there may have been a roof on the structure hmm. uh, we don't know what the structure was for and we don't know who built it um, but well, was there it, any writing on any of the monoliths or anything? No, not that, not that they recorded. Okay. I'm sure they would have recorded right, it had right. they because they were thorough. But um, but the structure was there, and it is um, not there now. Yeah. <laughs> it, it it was there uh, about through 1950. It was it was visible, and now mm -hmm. if you drive by the area, and in the map, the original survey map actually shows a road, and it says Modern Highway. And the Modern Highway has a name, and it's called Skyline Drive. Mm -hmm. So basically, at about Skyline Drive and Scott Road, Scott Road swings around in a semicircle. So you know, there's two actually two connections to Scott Road, but you know, the first one if you're going out onto the point. Um, that is about where it is or it, was and, and, what, and what is it now it looks like a vineyard and mm. a woods yeah. it was a, a part of a pine pine plantation but even so um people think that um it's still there just well, part of it isn't. Part of it is, they say, taking the stone for other purposes. Some right. people did way back when take stone from it to build a Wagner house at the end of the port. So, I mean, mm. there's certain things that disappeared. But I think mostly um, the belief is it's just kind of overgrown and now you don't see it anymore. As there's, things probably, do. there's probably more of it underground, too, a little exactly. bit. Exactly. In the 1960s, um, the phone company sent a, a machine down with some men to, and it was supposed to lay lines underground. Mm -hmm. And it began hitting upright stones that mm. appeared to be the same form as what was described as a graded weight. So people believe it's still there. We're just not seeing it. Um, at, at the time um, the survey was done, the, the rights thought this was a, a extremely important site. Yeah. They had never noticed anything like it before. And they um, they actually told the state of New York, you know, we believe this is an important site for the state and for the nation. You know, yeah, you should, yeah. you should um, preserve it and maybe send someone to examine it. The site was never, ever explored by an archaeologist. Of course not. And... Um, and the New York State didn't uh, seem to have any interest in, in doing so for <laughs> whatever reason. And yeah. um, um, however, around I want to say the 1930s, I think, I, um, there was a newspaper reporter from Canandaigua, and his name was Gil Brewer, and he was he decided he was going to do an amateur dig, hmm. and. He got together a bunch of people, just just right. folks. Yeah. And they went out during the summer 
and started digging. But Gil Brewer wasn't really an archaeologist. In fact, he he was not thorough like the Wrights. He wasn't professional in any sort right, of way. Right. And and there were a lot of reports of, of people actually planting artifacts oh. and playing hoaxes. And and so, you know, um, the they they supposedly found different things and then Gil Brewer comes out and says, Well well it couldn't have possibly have been made by Indians, so you know, it must have been the the Etruscans who made this site or or the um you know, or some Nordic group or you know, he he had a, a lot of people had different theories about sure, this. Sure. But the probably the the most astute were from the rights themselves who actually had some education on things. And what they believed, and and seems to be more and more true in my eyes, is um, they they thought they saw the most similarity. They thought the site was unique. It didn't really look like anything else they'd seen, but it it looked the most, they thought, like the Hopewell Mound Builders out in Ohio. Mm, Okay. And and, and people people didn't believe this. People at the time didn't believe that... um, any sort of Native Americans could have built a right, structure of right. this sort, and and also, um, um, well, the the Hopewell were were mound builders. They were ancient mound builders. Mm-hmm. They um, lived after the Adena. The Adena were, um, I think, I think um, a culture that came before them, and. At the time, there were no known Hopewell sites in New York. But since that time, there have been in Western New York discoveries of Hopewell sites. Um, I this summer I had the 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 wonderful chance. I went driving home from Texas, and <laughs> <laughs> it was a long drive. And, I and bet. In, in the dead of in February, in uh. February, I stopped. At the Newark Earthworks, <laughs> and I wanted to see what the what these uh, Hopewell now builder sites were mm-hmm. like, and mm-hmm. it was incredible because the Newark Earthworks site is, I think, the biggest earthwork site in the world. I mean, hmm. a lot of people haven't even heard of it. Yeah, and it's it was it it spanned miles. It was huge. Now some of that has been swallowed up by you know, civilization, yeah. as we call yeah. it. But <laughs> um, so, there, but there are segments that remained and the Great Circle remains and there's a little museum by that. And the, the Great Circle remained because they began to use it as um, like a fairgrounds and they would have oh, their okay. fairs inside. Okay. And then another part actually survived because I think in the 1920s, they turned it into an exclusive golf course. Hmm. And you could golf inside this, you know, huge thing, but right, but right. it still exists because it's maintained by that. And I thought, you know, I'm so stupid coming here in the middle of February, but actually it was a great, great time to go because um, unless you're a member of the golf club, you can't go there except in the oh. winter. And you can only, and in the winter, you can only go on a Monday. I don't know why. I happen <laughs> to be there on a Monday in the winter. So, you know, I was able to actually go onto the, you know, the, site, the site and see itself, it. Yeah. And what they've learned um, in more recent years, that the Hopewell didn't leave a written language, nothing that anyone's found. They've left some artifacts. Right. Uh, but they, the artifacts don't directly tell us what these sites were for or how they used them. So, you know, it's it's still a m- kind of mysterious. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, um, the, but they did find more recently that there was a connection between the one area they, I, they call the observatory and when the moon rises, the way the moon rises at a certain period of time. So there's, there may have been some astrological yeah. Well, most, most big sites like that do have some astrological... Yeah, there, there were a couple genuine artifacts that they think are in association with the site at Bluff Point, mm. um, where I think local local people who maybe they were plowing their field or whatever came across a couple copper points 
Mm. And those are actually in the New York State Museum. They're, oh, and you can okay. see pictures of them online. They're real. I mean, not, <laughs> right, unlike, right. unlike your Brewer's stuff, you know, like, you know, the, the, you know, and we found, you know, copper discs oh. with the pictures of animals and women. It's like, where are these things? We don't know. Uh, well, yeah, uh, if you can't uh, produce them, that does make, make kind of yeah, an issue. It, it's just, yeah, it's just kind of iffy in, in the whole well, thing. There, but, but, these, but these were real. And the, the copper, though, is important because... Um, you know, the people here, that, well, first of all, the site, when the people settled Bluff Point, the, Indi the, the Seneca was still there. Okay. And they asked them, did you build this? And they said, no. So, um, you know, first of all, they deny building it. And, and, and it doesn't look like their stuff anyway. Right. And, and the, the, um, the Iroquois didn't use copper. They, they really weren't metal workers. Right, so, right. you know, the, this is interesting that these, these copper points exist because, I mean, the Hopewell did. They had a, a big copper source out near Lake Superior, and they yep, also yep. had an incredible um, trade pathway across much of what is the United States. They had yep. an incredible trade system. So, you know, it very well could have been one of these mound building sites the um the i know the newark earthworks you know it wasn't made with stone it was actually an earthwork this is stone but they did have stone out in the observatory part they had stone capping so you know it's not without precedent right, right. that this could have been okay we so, gotta we gotta take a quick break and we'll be right back with melanie zimmer where Did the Road Go can be heard first and usually live on WVBR Saturday nights at 11 p.m. Eastern. Go to WhereDidTheRoadGo.com to ask questions of our live guests through the chat room. Where Did the Road Go is then re-aired on Dark Matter Radio and Deprogrammed Radio. You can download all shows for free on the website and you can subscribe to us on Stitcher, iTunes, YouTube, or Vimeo. Additional content can be found on our video channels. You will also find our upcoming schedule, book reviews, blogs, free book downloads, links, and more. We are also on Facebook and Twitter, and if you want to help support the show, there are links to donate to us. Everything you need can be found at WhereDidTheRoadGo.com. And tonight we've been talking with Melanie Zimmer about uh well some of the uh, well her new book curiosities of the finger lakes but just some of the unusual stuff in upstate new york in general and uh you want to tell people where they can find the book oh well they can find it um on amazon they can find it at barnes and noble you can find it um at your local bookstore probably okay and you have a website as well i do um it's www.thepuppets dot com and there's no separation I, just... I can't believe you got that domain name you know what i i bid on that on ebay can you believe uh, it okay all right <laughs> is that, that bizarre that makes sense though is, because is that, yeah it seems like someone would have grabbed that very early on yeah well i've had it a while all right. Okay. Best twenty bucks I ever spent. <laughs> that's 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 pretty good. If you're bidding on eBay and got it for twenty bucks. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you, uh, we were talking about these ancient ruins and stuff, and uh, there are some people who, uh, some very you know, uh, alternative researchers who will say the Vikings have been here and that some of these other cultures have been here. You know what I learned? I, I went up to, to um, Soda's Point because they wanted to have me speak on this book, mm -hmm. and. I didn't know this. They, they, did you know they have a Viking spear tip up there? Really? They I do. Did not. It was the, the northernmost uh, Vi um, Viking artifact it, um, was found right there. I guess during um, um, a terrible storm, um, things got wrecked up, and, mm -hmm. and a man had a boathouse there. And I think this was in the 1920s. And he one of the pilings was damaged and he needed to put a new piling in so he dug a hole it was like four feet down or something right and and he found actually this this viking artifact and they they brought it up and they actually have it um i believe in their local museum oh nice yeah. Nice. So. So. Yeah. So. Actually. Now. Of course, we don't know that they were there. I right. Mean, they could right, have. It could have been right. traded. It could have. You know, sure. come from some other area. But. But. You know. The, the, there is enough suggestive evidence that we might have it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> There's also the weird. The, the weird case in the Grand Canyon where a, apparently Egyptian ruins were found, 
And the whole area has been cordoned off. You can't go there. Uh, it all has Egyptian names. And it was written up by, a, by a, an archaeologist back around the turn of the century talking about this find of what he found there. And it was completely covered up and dismissed. And now no one's allowed in that area. So it's kind of a weird kind of question mark there. Like, why are you not letting people into this part of the Grand Canyon? And why does it have all Egyptian names now? <laughs> I've never heard of that. How yeah. interesting. It's, it's kind of an obscure little story. They've, they actually covered it on, on uh, America, Un America Unearthed which uh, was a decent episode. It also had Jerry Wills on, who we've had on the show before, because he knew a decent amount about it. But it, uh, until then, it really did, wasn't in the public eye at all. So, mm -hmm. But let's get into some of the ghost stories, since we are coming up on Halloween. You had a couple of interesting ones in there. Oh, um, how about... Well, uh, there's, there's a few of them. Uh, yeah, let's, actually, let's, how, let's start. How about, how about the buried treasure at Indian sure. Pines? Yeah, that one works. <laughs> there was, oh, let me, let me, let me look this, this up here. This, is, this was an, an, an interesting story. I wasn't expecting, I actually found it at the Historical Society um, down by the Oliver House. And um, it's, it's a little story that they, they tell out there, but it's, it's actually... Um, historical in, in nature has been, you know, told a while. Um, so in, in uh, 1787, and there was a man named Jacob uh, Fredenberg, and he he basically fled Massachusetts because he had been um, active in Shays Rebellion, and I, I, he was hiding out. So he he found a lovely place on Keuka Lake um, among the Seneca, um, among some pine trees, and he began to, to live there. And uh, he wasn't really fluent in Seneca, and or and the, the Seneca really weren't fluent in English. But somehow, <laughs> somehow they worked somehow, it out. Somehow they communicated, um, and they they told the story that um, a group of Frenchmen had come through with a, a whole load of of uh, of gold, and um, he got the impression. And, and, well, they were headed to to New Orleans, and um, he got the impression that um, somehow this gold was ill-gotten, or or maybe they were going to do something bad with it. He wasn't exactly sure. I guess there was some sort of language barrier there. But but then um, he met a, a man, um, a gunsmith and blacksmith who was working there. It was a Frenchman, um, and um, well, I, I should tell you that. These, these people with the gold, they had stayed there a while, and I don't know, they must have worn out their welcome because one night the Seneca just attacked them and pretty much wiped them out except for a couple mm. young people they adopted into their number. It was just not normal behavior for them. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, who knows? I mean, this is, uh, yeah. But anyway, so, so at the time that uh, Fredenberg went down there, you know, he... He saw there was this gunsmith, and he was a Frenchman. He was kind of living there, and you know, among the Seneca, and doing gun work for them, I presume. And and um, one day he he noticed that this man had this really detailed map, and he was sure, you know, that this was the map of where the gold was mm. buried, because because the the Seneca, no matter how they tried, they never did find the gold. So. So he was convinced that it was there. And at one point he left again and he went back probably to Massachusetts. And then when he returned, um, this uh, French gunsmith was, was missing and he never learned uh, the exact location of the treasure. But the place where it is is actually a park. Yeah, <laughs> today. So you can actually go there and, and um, see. It's, it's right at an inlet um, in, at um, Cuca Lake. And, um, oh dear, what's the name of the place? I'd love to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, but, um, but, um, no one ever found the treasure, but there were a number of stories of treasure seekers. And sometimes people would go, go down there and they'd be looking for it. And uh, a couple of people were bothered by some sort of uh, supposedly otherworldly creature that looked like half like a calf and half like a, 
lion or something like that. Um, Interesting. Something mysterious um, anatomy. Right. <laughs> uh, there were some people that went down and, and they, they were digging and they, they hit something that they thought actually was a coffin. Mm. And, and, um, and then uh, I guess this, this creature appeared to them and they decided that they'd better hightail it out of there <laughs> because, they, you know, this was no good, you know. And, right. and they, they somehow managed to escape into their, their little boat and row off just in time. Um, so, so that's one of the little stories that, you know, hmm. that um, so happens to be around the area. Potentially it could still be there if there ever was a treasure to begin with. Yeah, if you have a good metal detector. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> let's, uh, let's talk about Willard a little bit. Ah, well, the Willard Insane Asylum. That was actually a very well-intentioned experiment. <laughs> um, um, Willard Insane Asylum was an answer to the horrible way that people were treated, um, the insane were treated at that time. In, in the 1800s, the people... Uh, there was really no treatment for insanity. I mean, you pretty right, much got locked right. in a room and, and they throw away the key and, that, and that's basically it. Um, but the idea with Willard was that, you know, we're going to put this beautiful place uh, right on Seneca Lake where it will be very calming and beautiful for people. And, and there was a recreation center and there was, you know, uh, if you wanted to work, you could work there. And there was um, different things people could do. So um, it was very well intentioned. <laughs> it, I, I, I think it, it actually operated for, gosh, what was it, like 150, 130 yeah, years yeah. It, it, for a great, great long time. Um, the problem with Willard, I think, is um, there were a couple of problems with Willard, but one of the problems was that, um, again, you know, you kind of go in and you don't come out again. Right, right. And, and you didn't really have to even be insane to go there. I mean, you, you could have, um, you could just be an unwanted relative and they, you know, they send you off. Right. Or, you know, there was an instance of a, of a black um, war hero who, mm -hmm. who, who had a, um, I think he became an angered in a, in a restaurant when um, people treated him poorly and, and they just decided, hey, you know, we'll just send you off to Willard, goodbye. Um, so people would check in, they you know, check in with a single suitcase. And if at one point, in fact, there, there was... Um, are you familiar with the exhibit? There was this exhibit of suitcases from the no. attic in Willard. Yes. Um, so these were all the forgotten people of Willard. And, and there were thousands and thousands of people who, you know, were in Willard over the years. Hmm. And, and these, when they died, their suitcase would go up to the attic with all their personal belongings. And oftentimes no one claimed them or, you know, they didn't come and take the, take the body. They didn't take you know, the person's belongings, they were just forgotten there. Right. So, so some people had gone and they made an exhibit of uh, different people's suitcases um, to show the lives of, of these people who basically vanished into Willard. And um, there was, um, there is a cemetery in there. It's very sad. I, I, I went there myself and I, I, I saw the sign for the Willard Cemetery mm -hmm. and I, I mm -hmm. went in and I was looking around, where is the cemetery? Not realizing <laughs> I'm standing yeah. on it. It's a meadow. And, and they put it right by the water, I guess, to, you know, but oh, it's a great, but view, great view. It, it is, but you know, you, you don't see any markers for people. And I think originally there were numbers, like yes. little plug numbers yep. put in the ground. That's all they got. Just like, okay, yep. number 59. You and know. That, there's 5,776 5, people buried there. It's, it's an incredible number of people. And they, the only people really who have markers are uh, veterans. Yes, because the government, I think, would pay for a marker. But when I, when um, I was growing up, um, I used to spend a lot of time down there. I had a bunch of friends who lived in that town, and at one point, we started going up to that graveyard because partially because of the view. And I will say, some of the weirdest stuff ever happened up there. I uh, found it frightening. It I mean, is a very haunted area. There were also times where we'd be walking along, and everything would go dead quiet, and it would just give you the creepiest feeling, like something was watching you. Um, at one point, they did have a little building with tombstones in it and they would be little metal plates with numbers they weren't like plugs they were actually mm -hmm. little small tombstone like things with numbers on uh -huh. them and at some point they just kind of disappeared 
There's also two Jewish cemeteries that were completely overgrown with thorn bushes at that time. And yes, the Jewish cemetery is is still there. I didn't know there were two of them. I, I noticed one sign. There, well, there's there's one sign um, and then over, tw- well, maybe it wasn't a Jewish cemetery. It, looked, it was overgrown the same way, kind of just off to the side of it in between that and the uh, the veterans Okay, uh, maybe maybe. I uh, wish I had pictures of it because it looks completely different now. <laughs> yeah, and and um, I, <laughs> I I don't know. I, I was I was kind of appalled at at the lack of any sort of you know marker with names or yeah. anything yeah. whatsoever. Um, it's really frightening. One thing I, I this is just kind of an aside. It's the thing I discovered talking to a. Uh, um, the funeral director once is there as is there actually a state fund for cemeteries mm-hmm. um if you uh i guess when someone dies there's a small fee that they pay whenever someone has a funeral and that money can go to cemeteries for upkeep oh. you know for for you know to refurbish things or or do things where there are problems such as you know i i actually think this is a problem but you know uh, that that's a lot of people that's a, lot of, a people lot of people who are not who are not recognized and, and they're they're trying um, to remedy it currently are, are they yes yeah there that's are projects good. that are that are that's where that sign came from that sign is new oh good, good. And, they, and they are trying to clean it up they're trying to figure out where people are buried who's actually buried there and so on and so forth so yeah. but we we used to go up there because the view it's on it's, it's um, a beautiful view it comes up to a cliff the the meadow ends in a cliff and there's a road down below and then there's just a, a seneca lake yeah. So you get this amazing view of the lake, and uh, sometimes we'd just go sit at the cliff edge. And we had actually, the, one of the creepiest things that happened, uh, when they had that stone building there with all the tombstones, there was a broken one. And we picked it up, and we were teenagers at the time. We're like, oh, cool, you know, broken tombstone. And we took it, and we put it over where we would sit. And we kind of hid it under the bush. And the next day, we came back, and it was gone. And we're like, well, who would take that? You know, it was hidden, and, and who would want it in the first place other yeah. than us, you know? And so as we were leaving, I'm looking over to the right by the cliff, and I see the tombstone. I'm like, well, what's it doing sitting there? And I can't get to it. There's no way to get to it, and it's sitting in a cleared-out area with three sticks on each side. And I literally had to push my way through the bush to get to it, and I had to break it. There's no way anyone could have gotten to that area to put it there in the first place. How utterly bizarre. Yeah. And my, my friend who was with me is like, I want to leave now. I just want to go. You know, I am not easily frightened, but that place was, I, I do think that was a bit It's frightening. unnerving. You know, um, I think right there, you know, when you go down to um, the water, uh, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. ac- across, I think that that is where... Um, the the people would come the, originally when they brought the people to Willard um, the first person who came they know her name and it was Mary Rote and she arrived by steamboat mm. and she was um, I apparently um, you know some of the people who who went to Willard they were just poor I mean they yeah. weren't even insane yeah. you could be you know just like they were using it as a poorhouse or whatever um, Mary Rote I think had been in chains previously and mm. you know treated very badly so i mean it was it was a new concept but you know it, there there's still some some issues with that well, i sure. guess later on they they used uh, or were said to have used uh, electric shock treatment and, and you know some frontal lobotomies and psychiatric drugs at least some of the stories say that this people suspect these are some things that went on there so um it apparently wasn't the panacea that they had hoped. Right, right. Um, now a lot, and I know a lot of ghost hunters have wanted to go in there and uh, do ghost research and ghost hunts in there because there's so many stories coming out of it of haunted stuff going on in there. Uh, actually, the ghost hunters we have here next week, ghost hunters from the Finger Lakes, uh, they weren't allowed to actually investigate, but they were allowed to take pictures when they took a tour. Mm-hmm. And uh, he had used his infrared camera and took a picture of one of the walkways because he felt someone watching him from it and got a picture of a woman standing there. Really? Yeah. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> And it was one of those things where I'm like, I don't see a woman. And then I look closer, I'm like, oh, my God, I really do see a woman. It was a very clear image. It's just kind of like very faded, you know, like really in the background. You have to actually look for it. But the detail is there. Oh, fascinating. So, I don't know. Let's, uh, 
There was another one I, I found really interesting. I was at the well, the Erie Mansion. What was the one with the tunnel? Oh, Bellhurst Castle. That one. Oh yeah, Bellhurst Castle. That that is really uh, an interesting story. And um, there, there's two stories. There's the true story, and there's the legend. So <laughs> they're both kind of interesting, okay. though. So so the true story is that. Um, that actually, that location was where a Seneca village was originally, but um, the property was purchased by Phelps and Gorman in 1738. And then, um, it, you know, it, it changed hands a few times and eventually a Mr. Joseph Fellows, who was a lawyer from England, purchased it. And, and on the property was built a place called the Hermitage and a man named Henry Hall uh, began to occupy it. And he had but a single servant and he, you know, he lived there apparently just wanted his privacy. Um, well, eventually the man died. And um, after in some investigations, they discovered that he had been the treasurer at Covenant Gardens and had embezzled a whole bunch of money and moved there hmm. after marrying his um, stepmother. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I, I, I believe the servant might have been the stepmother. Uh. So that's the true story. Weird enough. But so what the legend is, is that there was... A, a Spaniard who fell in love with an Italian opera singer and he killed her boyfriend and mm. left his wife and they fled for America where they wanted to to basically lie low because the Spaniard's wife had a lot of money and she sent men out looking for them. Mm. <laughs> so they, they built a house to their specifications and um, since they were always concerned about their own personal safety, they built a tunnel from the house to the water where they always kept a boat at the ready and uh, apparently a bunch of gold in case they needed to leave in a hurry. Well, sure. But the tunnel wasn't enough for them. You know, they had to, you know, make sure that they weren't followed. So, so there was actually a, a device where, I don't know if you pull the cord or a lever or some sort of thing, and then the whole tunnel collapses, you know, once you get to the stairs. So, um, so this was a safety feature, according to the legend. Anyway, one night... Um, the opera singer and the Spaniard were in bed and, and the Spaniard noticed men with torches coming to the house in the night. And that's never mm. a good thing. Well, so, yeah. so, so they decided to flee. They ran into the tunnel and they, they were racing through it, but she dropped her torch. He says, just keep on running, you know. And so he made it to the end and he waited and then it, it was rather dark. He felt somebody brush past him. He pulled the lever and, and collapsed it and got into the boat and waited and she never came. Mm. So, um, he was uh, so horribly upset. Apparently, he waited hours and hours for her, but she never came, and he left with nothing because he had lost his love. And they say he went back to Europe and spent the rest of his life in contemplation at a monastery. And you said this, the tunnel, you were told, does exist. Yes, I actually asked a, a staff member at the Bellhurst Castle, and they said that, that there is a tunnel. Um, but um, I wasn't allowed in it. I'm presuming for safety reasons. Right. right. <laughs> but um, also, it's like some people have um, mentioned um, that they see a woman, um, uh, the image of a woman sometimes mm -hmm. around the premises that they they believe is the opera singer mm. mourning the loss of her lover. All right. You're on WVBR FM. Ithaca. This is Where Did the Road Go? We're going to go a few more minutes here with Melanie Zimmer because I have a couple of other stories I want you to tell people that I thought were really interesting. And your new book is Curiosities of the Finger Lakes. And it's number four? Yes, it is number four. Okay. I wanted you to talk about uh, the other, oh, the Erie Mansion. Because that um, had some really interesting yeah, the hauntings. Erie Mansions, yeah. I did, how much time do I have on that one? I mean, is that, that is... Uh... <laughs> go for it. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, there's a couple... A couple of interesting things about them. Erie Mansion was actually the Smith E. Lee Mansion um, originally, and it belonged to uh, um, Mrs. E. Lee's mother. And she, the mother sold it to her, I don't know, for some nominal fee. And then she decided to redo the mansion in this different style. It, it never actually became one style. <laughs> after, right, right. Uh, so the mother wasn't all terribly happy about it. But nonetheless, um, she... Um, Deary and her husband, Charles Ely, had three children, and they were Wilhelmina, Eugenia, and William. But William was known as Billy. And Billy is actually who we'll be talking about because he was 
known as the the Broadway Playboy. What he would do, they were very rich, and he would just go down to New York and pick up some chorus girls and bring them back. And you know, it was it was um, apparently a, something he did frequently. Mm. Well, one day, someone in the community witnessed a woman running out of the mansion screaming, and then Billy, not far behind her, uh, came out and shot her in the head and then drained the body back into the mansion. Well, obviously, they reported it <laughs> immediately. You know, the police were on to this. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, people began to wonder, you know, well, what happened to all those other chorus girls? And, you know, there began some talk. Well, maybe we have a serial killer here. You know, it's going to be just this. This could be something really horrible. And um, so he became, of course, a prime suspect. And not long after that, it was announced in the paper that he had suddenly died of a heart attack serving his mother, who was bedridden, breakfast in bed on a tray. Hmm. Um, w- rumor was that he actually hanged himself. <laughs> because he was under investigation. Right, right, right. Um, so, um, you know, there there were a lot of reports of strange things going on in the house. I'll get to later, but before I do that, I actually want to tell you about the other violent incident that happened in the house. Okay. Um, Mrs. Um, Smith Ely um, employed several servants. It was a large house, and she had a Chinese chef, and his name was Moich. Um, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. <laughs> and and then she had a, a Japanese butler, and his name was Natsu Meta, and they hated each other. They hated each other very much. And one day she was in New York, and her neighbor notified her that the two of them were out chasing each other around the yard with knives and they had left the mansion <laughs> wide open and she should go home and take care of it right away. So she sent her trusted brochure, uh, chauffeur, James, back to take care of everything and he uh, closed up the house, but no one was to be found. And a few days later, um, Natsu Meta, the, the Japanese butler, um, arrived in New York and asked Mrs. Smith Ely for some money. He said, you know, I my father has died. I'm now as a son, I must go home and take care of things. And right, she right. said, go back to the mansion and do your job. Well, he was never heard, seen or heard from again, and neither was the Chinese chef <laughs> until they found his head in a box <laughs> in a local dive. Beautiful. And, and they never did find the rest of his body. They even looked for it, but they never did find wow. the body. So, so anyway, there was some... Incidents in the yeah, house. Just it, was, a bit. It, it would um, eventually the family. I guess they must have fallen on hard times, and they they sold the house, and it became various things over time. One of the things it became was uh, low income housing, of all things, mm. and so there were a number of residents living there, and so um, the the person who has the mansion now, his name is Mr. Wright. He um, He's done a lot of restoration work on the building, and he he has it open as a bed and breakfast. You can stay there. So some some stories people send him stories sometimes of the place, and some of the stories are from the low income housing days, and some mm-hmm. are from the you know bed and breakfast experiences. But there are some things. Um, um, someone has complained of ghost attacks. Um, visualizing outlines of people, light bulbs burning out, magnetic compasses going round and round, and apparitions, finding apparitions sleeping in bed with him. That would be disconcerting. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And he says the place is haunted. Another person says that some time to time an old woman would appear in a rocking chair, rocking aggressively, and then vanish suddenly. Or they would see a man watching them in bed at night. Um, uh, one couple said that um, they were restless and she felt like someone was touching her and her husband saw a man reflected in the windows and he appeared if he were behind them and he wearing black and uh, black suit and a white shirt and th- excuse me then he just vanished and they turned around and they saw nothing um, so there are all these different 
you know, and and then the list goes on and on. Um, <laughs> so there are all these different incidents <laughs> that uh, people complaining about things that um, they had experienced in that house. Wow! But um, no one, no one actually knows about the chorus girls. They did not. They didn't find the bodies, and so right, you don't right. really know what happened. And nobody really knows where and if he, um, Billy, hung himself in the house. Hmm. And where is the Erie Mansion located? Um, let me see. Give you a location here. I should. And in the notice. last couple of minutes, while you were talking about this, apparently we now have a thunderstorm and hailstorm going I on. I noticed outside. that. It's 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 uh, getting pretty violent out there. Oh, yeah. do I not put the address? Oh. That's okay. That's all right. Um, well, what city is it in? I always thought it was in Rochester. It's in Clyde. It's in Clyde. It's okay. in Clyde. Yeah, it, it says that there's a historic marker signed out. This is an interesting historical marker. Erie Mansion, B&B, &B, historically haunted, it says. <laughs> nice. <laughs> it does. <laughs> so, yeah, if, if you're looking for an, an interesting place to stay, it's a, a very uh, unique aesthetic. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, the book is... Curiosities of the Finger Lakes, Hidden Ancient Ruins, Flying Machines, The Boy Who Caught a Trout with His Nose, and more. It's on History Press, and you can find it everywhere? I hope so. <laughs> well, <laughs> everywhere locally, perhaps. Fair it, enough, but you can find it on Amazon. Absolutely, and, and Barnes and & Noble. It's, okay. it's in Barnes & Noble stores. Is there an um, e-version of it? Yes, there is. Okay. Yes, there is. So you can download it if you want it right away. <laughs> and your website? My website is www.thepuppets.com. All right. And I thank you. This has been a fascinating conversation. There's a lot more in this book. We only touched on a very little bit of it. And uh, you have three others. I do. And I they're, do. They're all on similar material? Um, the first one was Myth, Legend, and Lore, Central New York and the Finger Lakes, and that is exactly what it sounds like, okay. <laughs> Myth, Legend, and Lore. Um, the second book was Forgotten Tales of New York. It's more, um, that's a broader uh, geographical range. It's mm -hmm. it's all of New York except for um, New York City and Westchester area. Right. And the, it, people, the part everyone thinks is all of New York. Well, yeah. <laughs> this is our chance. And that's on more like little known characters or um, um, odd his, bits of history. Um, Curiosities of, the cent of Central New York was the third book. I actually wrote that the previous year. And that I intended it to be another myth, legend, and lore book, part of that series. Mm -hmm. And they said okay on that, and at the last minute, they changed the title to Curiosities of the Finger Lakes because they they didn't want people to think that they just, you know, recovered a book. They right, wanted right, to, right. the people to understand it was new material. Sure. So it, it actually does have a lot of, you know, that kind of thing in it, myth, legend, and lore. Um, mm -hmm. And then, of course, the this book today, Curiosities of the Finger Lakes. All right. Well, we'll have to have you back uh, early next year. And we can talk because there's a whole list of stuff we didn't even get to that I wanted I to talk know. about. I know. I, I talk. <laughs> no, that's fine. And it was quite interesting. So I thank you very much. You took a fairly long drive to get here. And now with the weather yeah, outside. Like, I'm glad every part closer. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we can do something about that and get you over to your car. <laughs> but that is it for Where the Road Go this week. We'll be ne back next week uh, on November 1st for our pseudo Halloween thing. We'll be, uh, have the Ghost Hunters of the Finger Lakes in studio. Well, at least one of them and Lorna Reynolds back. And, uh, yeah, that should be an interesting time www.wheretheroadgo.com. We'll see you next week. Here's some Psyche Corporation taking you out.